Are we good? Uh, uh, just a minute. I, I think it's still, maybe my internet is not very stable today. I hope it will work. Yeah, it's recording now. Okay, um, so uh, we are glad to have uh, David Williamson today um, to, um, to give a Tat Colloquium talk. And David um, received his PhD um, in back to 1993 from MIT. And since 2004, he's uh, a professor at uh, uh, Cornell. Um, he's, uh, ex he ex um, his um, ex expertise uh, is in operations research and uh, approximate algorithms. And for his work on um, approximation algorithms on SDP, he, he was the winner of the Fulkerson Prize in 2000. Um, today, he's going to talk about um, semi-definite programming relaxations of the traveling salesman problem. So, David. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation to be speaking in the Tut Colloquium at Waterloo. I'm only sorry that I can't be there in person. Uh, it's not that far away. Um, so I hope that maybe some point in the future when life is, looks a little different than it does right now, I can actually come and visit with you all. Um, the work I'm going to be talking about today is joint work with my former PhD student, Sam Gutekunst from Bucknell University, and Sam is on the call here, so uh, he will. you can talk to him also about the work at the end of this if you would like to ask questions. Um, and with that, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, so let's see if I got us, is this advancing up? Did that slide advance for everybody? I guess they're all muted, but they're nodding. Okay, so that's good. So uh, although I'm talking to an audience that I'm sure is very familiar with this topic, I just want to make sure that everybody is on the same playing field when we talk about when I talk about the traveling salesman problem and various things connected to it. So some, for some of this, this will be quite a, uh, uh, just a review. Uh, for others, hopefully, it'll be enough of an introduction that uh, you'll be able to follow the rest of the talk. So the traveling salesman problem is probably the most famous problem in all of discrete optimization. And the goal is that if we're given a set of cities and then some either distances or costs for traveling between them, we'd like to find the shortest tour that visits all the cities and returns to the start. And over here on the right-hand side of the screen, I have uh, 120 cities. Um, if you consider the distance between them as being, uh, Euclidean distance between them as being the cost of traveling between any pair. Um, I'd like to find the tour that visits all of them and returns to its start point. Um, at the time this was solved to optimality, this was the largest tour uh, instance of the traveling salesman problem that had been solved to optimality. This is 120 cities from what was then Western Germany. Pretty easy to pick out the third city of Berlin over here on the, uh, out here on the right. Um, and uh, this was solved to, by, to optimality by Martin Grochel in 1977. Um, I will be mentioning Waterloo faculty uh, throughout this talk, um, and certainly lots of the images that I'm taking for this first part of the lecture were drawn from Bill Cook's collection of TSP uh, images and so on uh, that's at the, hosted at the University of Waterloo. So a lot of times it'll be useful to talk about the TSP in terms of, a, in terms of graph theory. So for that, we'll think about having a complete undirected graph. There are costs Cij associated with every possible edge Ij except for self loops. Um, we'll assume for this purposes of this talk that costs are symmetric, so going from city I to city J just costs just the same as going from J to I, and that costs are either metric or obey the triangle inequality, whichever term you prefer, which just says that Cij is less than or equal to Cik plus Ckj for all triples Ij and K. That is, it's no advantage to you to take some shortcut to get between city I and J. So in terms of graph theory, what we're trying to do is find a minimum cost Hamiltonian cycle, the cheapest cycle that visits every city exactly once. So here's another famous Waterloo uh, faculty member. Um, so over 50 years ago, uh, Jack Edmonds, in a very famous paper, said that he conjectured that there is no good, what today we would call a polynomial time, um, algorithm for the traveling salesman problem. My reasons are the same as for any mathematical conjecture. One, it is a legitimate mathematical possibility. And two, I do not know. And I think this was a very bold conjecture on Jack's part. It certainly has proven true over the last 50 years to have been extremely bold conjecture. And it makes me, uh, in some cases, think I should be making similar bold conjectures about things. It has given me prompts to action in some cases. Um, and 
the thing about um, what Jack said is that both statements continue to be true, right? It's a legitimate mathematical possibility that there is no polynomial time algorithm for the traveling salesman problem, and two, we still don't know the answer. Um, there has been some codification of, of what this means, and now there's much more evidence that the, the mathematical possibility seems closer to being a reality, but to, we, the second statement still holds true, we still don't know. So finding an optimal solution uh, in the decision version of the traveling salesman problem is known to be NP-complete. The finding an optimal solution is known to be what's called NP-hard. That is, we have no efficient or no polynomial time method for finding the optimal solution in every instance, aside from doing what's essentially complete enumer enumeration, just trying all possible tours and searching for the best one. However, there's a, a fairly subtle point here, uh, or maybe not so subtle, um, that needs to be acknowledged, which is that it doesn't mean that finding the solution to any particular instance of the traveling salesman problem, in fact, is difficult. And this point is sometimes uh, lost on people. So here's a, a quote that Bill Cook uh, tweeted a couple years back. Um, from the Washington Post, uh, there was an article about quantum computers in order to press, impress people about quantum computers and how fast they are. Uh, it talks about the traveling salesman problem and how that if you did complete enumeration on 22 cities, it would take a laptop computer a thousand years to compute the most efficient route. Well, of course, that's not true. In practice, we can very quickly compute the optimal solutions to most 22 city instances. Um, so uh, Bill notes that this is a couple of orders of magnitude off from reality. It says, like reporting that the US national debt is $4, uh, which is certainly not the case, especially these days. Um, so here's a picture of Bill, um, together with covers of two of the books that uh, he's written. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have The Traveling Salesman Problem, written with some co-authors, David Applegate, Bob Bixby, and Vasha Klatel. Uh, about all the computational work that they did in, in computing optimal solutions to very large scale traveling salesman problem. And on uh, the left, we have a, sort of the more popular book that he wrote to, in the pursuit of the traveling salesman problem about that work. And I can recommend both books to you highly. So just to get some sense of what Bill and his team have done, although I suppose at Waterloo, many of you might well be familiar with all of this. Um, back about over 20 years ago, they solved to optimality this 13,000 city instance from drawn from cities in the continental United States. So they're the set of cities, and here's the optimal tour that they found. For a slightly larger instance, a couple years later, they computed the optimal solution to 25,000 cities, roughly, uh, in the country of Sweden. Uh, and there's the set of cities, and then there's the optimal solution to that particular tour. Now, there's a TSP researcher named Ulla Svensson who is from Sweden, and he knows that the population of Sweden itself is only about 10 million people, so the word city is kind of a misnomer here. On average, you'd have about 400 people per city covered in this store. So you can think of this as routing through all the villages and towns of Sweden. Here's another tour that's very popular, for, especially for people in the U.S. to take with their high school children, um, which is to visit various colleges. I just did some of this last summer with my teenage daughter. Um, and that's to take a tour of colleges in the U.S. And Bill quite helpfully computed a tour of 647 of the top college campuses in the U.S. So if you look up here in the upper uh, right-hand corner, Cornell is in here somewhere. Uh, this is only cities in the U.S., unfortunately, so it did not get up to Waterloo, which certainly would have made the list of top colleges in the North America if there were such a list. Um, and yet, here's one last final uh, example of, of Bill's work, which is what he termed the ultimate pub crawl. Uh, so I'm going to try a video here over Zoom. We'll see how it worked. It worked okay in our initial uh, trials, but let's see how it goes. So Bill uh, computed the, op the optimal tour to visit 50,000 pubs inside the UK. The yellow dots were there were uh, in Wales, the green dots, Northern Ireland, the blue dots there in Scotland, we're going back down through England now. Um, initially, he computed a tour on 25,000 cities a couple years before that, but uh, 25,000 pubs, um, but he started getting plenty of complaints once that uh, tour was made public about all the favorite pubs that he was missing. So he and his co-authors did the hard work of expanding that to twice as many to get 50,000 pubs. Um, and I'm sure Bill can tell you more about the story behind uh, that computation. All of this work about computing the tours going through bunches of cities from various countries has its 
or origin point in the methodology that was used to actually compute these tours. And that's a famous 42 city instance um, that was solved to optimality for cities in the continental United States by Danzig, Fulkerson, and Johnson in 1954. Now, the methodology that they use is still at its heart the methodology that gets used by Bill and his team to compute these optimal solutions to these very, very large um, TSP instances, and indeed to lots of different problems in combinatorial optimization that get solved every day by um, very well-established integer programming um, solvers these days. So let me quickly get, go through the methodology uh, just to make sure that everybody's familiar with it, although I assume many people are. Um, so the idea is this, that we're going to write down a linear program using some variables x sub e. These variables are going to stand for whether the, a given edge is in our tor or not. So the idea is that the variable x e should be 1 if the edge is in the tor, 0 if it isn't. Since we're writing a linear program, um, we can only restrict that these variables have to lie between 0 and 1. And we're going to start by introducing a bunch of linear constraints that are satisfied by any particular integer tor, and then go ahead and solve that LP. If we happen to get a solution that's integer, then that's good. We'll actually have found the optimal, uh, optimal tor. Um, if the solution to the LP, in fact, is not integer, then we're going to add more constraints. These are called cutting planes. As long as there's, we know that they'd be satisfied by any possible integer tor, but are not satisfied by the current LP solution. So the set of constraints that were considered by Danzig, Fulkerson, and Johnson are the, the ones in this LP here. So our overall objective is to minimize the cost of the edges in the, the tour that we have, um, subject to two different types of constraints. So the first type of constraint is usually called the degree constraint. And it just says that if I take any particular city or any particular vertex in my graph, I want to make sure that the sum of all the incident edges to that, um, to that vertex has a sum of LP variables that's exactly equal to 2, because we know that any tour is going to enter uh, that particular vertex and leave it again. There's going to be exactly two edges of the tor incident on any given vertex. The other um, set of constraints, which they added one, Danzig, Fulkerson, and Johnson added, but one by one is needed, um, are what are called the subtor elimination constraints. They call these loop conditions, um, but the term that we use these days is called subtor elimination constraints, and it just says, give me any non-trivial set of vertices, take a look at that set of vertices, and take a look at all the edges that we say are in we're terming delta s, all edges that have one endpoint inside that set and one endpoint outside of it. If we sum up over all those uh, LP variables, that sum should be greater than or equal to 2, because we know that any given tour is going to have to come and enter that set, um, visit some of the cities, and then leave again. Of course, it's also possible that the tour can enter and leave that set many different times. Um, so that sum should be always at least 2, but it's not going to be any less than 2, because the tour will certainly enter once and then leave once. Um, if we require that these variables actually be integer, if they're 0, 1, then this would give us an integer program that exactly solves the traveling salesman problem. And if we instead just impose the constraint of the linear program that these variables lie between 0 and 1, it's what we call a relaxation of the traveling salesman problem. The integer solutions are all feasible for this. They satisfy all the constraints. Um, and since we're minimizing, uh, if we allow ourselves this larger space in which we allow variables to lie between 0 and 1 rather than being equal to 0 and 1, then we're only going to find a solution that costs no more than the cost of an integer tour. Now, one of the things uh, that's true about using these bounds within the kind of project that Danzig, Volkerson, and Johnson set out is that, the, in general, the closer the value of the linear program is to the value of the optimal integer solution, um, the easier it is to use these various techniques to find integer solutions quickly. So it's easier for us to use cutting planes or to use techniques called branch and bound to actually find these integer solutions quickly. The better the bound we have, the closer it is to the value of the optimal uh, integer solution, the better off and the more quickly these techniques usually work. So we can ask ourselves the question, how good is this LP? Right, this LP is sometimes called a subtour elimination LP, or sometimes just a subtour LP for short, or sometimes also the held card LP, named after uh, two authors who gave some methodology for solving this particular um, linear program quickly. So how good is the subtour LP? Well, various computational experiments have shown that, in fact, this LP is quite good in practice, that the bound that it gives is very close to the cost of an optimal integer tour. 
So here's a, a table that's taken from a paper written by David Johnson and Lyle McGue uh, about 20 years ago, where they looked at um, how close they could get to the optimal tour using the subtour LP. And down this second column here, you see what they call percent gap. And that's just the gap between the value of the optimal LP and the, the optimal integer tour. And you can see that for these random instances, so random uniform Euclidean, random clustered Euclidean, um, they were usually getting solutions within 1%. There's actually one, just one case where it was over 1% by, and it was 1.01. .01. Over here on the right-hand side, we have a, what instances from what's called a TSP lib, a standard library of traveling salesman problem instances. And there, the percentage gaps are a little bit weaker, but still not farther away than, than 2%. Uh, most are under 1% or, or, or certainly all are under 2%. So this found, it turns out to be extremely good in practice. And it's one of the things that allows us to solve, solve these large scale instances quickly uh, and find integer, optimal integer solutions. Um, I come from a theoretical computer science background. And one of the things that, one of the ways we approach questions is to ask ourselves sort of not how well does it work in practice, but how well does it work in the worst case? Um, so let's take that question. If the sub to LP bound is good in practice, what can we say about it in the worst case? And one way of measuring that is something called the integrality gap of an LP re relaxation. So we're interested in knowing what's the worst case ratio over all possible sets of costs that are symmetric and obey the triangle inequality of the cost of the optimal tour to the cost of the optimal LP solution for that same, same set of costs. Uh, how, what, what is this bound? What is this bound in the worst case? Uh, a couple of things are known about this. Um, so back in 1976, two authors, um, Christofides and Sergikov, independently discovered an algorithm that produces a Hamiltonian cycle whose cost was in a factor of three halves of the cost of an optimal tour. In, in 1980, Lawrence Wolsey showed that, uh, in fact, that the christofides sergikov algorithm does something a little bit better than that. It always finds a tour or a Hamiltonian cycle whose cost was in a factor of three halves of the subtour LP, not the optimal, optimal tour, but within the cost of the sub subtour LP. And this result was subsequently discovered, uh, rediscovered several times, once by Bill Cunningham, who I saw was on our call, uh, then a couple years after that by David Schmoyes and myself. Um, that gives us the following chain of inequalities. The tour that this algorithm discovers, of course, uh, has costs no, no smaller than the cost of the optimal tour. Um, Wolsey showed uh, that that's within three halves of the optimal LP solution which again, the L optimal LP solution gives us a lower bound than the cost of the optimal, uh, optimal tour itself. So we get this following chain of inequalities. And one of the things that this shows us is that the integrality gap of the, the subtour LP is at most three halves. So for any set of costs that obey the triangle inequality and are symmetric, we have that the cost of the optimal tour to the LP solution, the integrality gap is at most three halves. Um, here's a particular set of instances for the traveling salesman problem. Suppose I take three long paths that each have k vertices in them and join them in this way. And let's suppose that I say the cost of traveling between any pair of cities is just the number of edges and the shortest path between that pair of cities in this particular graph. Then if I solve the subtour LP on this instance, I essentially get a solution that looks like this. The LP puts um, L variables, uh, the LP variables are set to one for all the edges on these three paths. And then at the end, I have these triangles where the LP sets all the variables equal to a half. Now, if I look at the cost of the optimal tour here, um, I get something like this. So if I start at this vertex that's in the middle at the lower end, I can go up this path here uh, at a cost of K, go over to here, go back down this path at another cost of k, go over to here, visit the third pass at a cost of 3k, and then finally I have to double back again at a cost of something like another k. So the LP solution has cost us essentially something like 3k, the cost of the optimal tour is something like 4k, and that shows us that the integrality gap in this case um, has to be at least four thirds for these instances as we take k going to infinity. So this example shows us that the integrality gap of this relaxation is at least four thirds. And thus we have that for any set of uh, costs that obey the, that are metric and obey the triangle, sorry, symmetric and obey the triangle inequality, the integrality gap lies between four thirds and three halves. Um, all of this has been known for uh, at least 40 years. Um, 
but the interesting thing is that over those 40 years, we haven't been able to improve on this situation at all. We don't know of any stronger lower bound on the integrality gap. We don't know of any stronger upper bound on the integrality gap. Our state of knowledge is just where it was, uh, essentially when Wolsey um, proved the, this factor of three halves uh, on the Christofides algorithm. Um, it's been widely conjectured um, that in fact, this integrality gap should be four over three, that it should be at its lower bound. But uh, of course, we still don't really actually know uh, what this, the situation is in the, this case of symmetric edge costs at bay is a triangle inequality. There was a, a recent quite exciting breakthrough. Um, the first progress on Christofides approximation algorithm um, in 1976 was just announced this past summer. Um, and uh, Anna Carlin, Nathan Klein, and Cheyenne Weiss Garan announced that they could do just slightly better than the Christofides three halves approximation algorithm in the case of metric and symmetric edge costs. And by slightly, I really mean slightly. They mean to improve the factor of three halves by 10 to the minus 36. Um, so that was quite exciting in the sense that we haven't had progress on this bound for uh, over 40 years. But you can see the improvement is quite slight. And in fact, it does not improve the analysis of the integrality gap at all. This just says that they can find a tour that's a co this and most this much times the cost of the optimal tour. They're not showing that it's at most that much times the cost of the sub -therapy. So there's this outstanding open problem of trying to prove a tight bound on the integrality gap uh, of the subtor LP, and we still don't know the answer. This, um, I, I imagine many people on this phone call, I certainly know this true of Jochen and probably of Andras and several other people on this call, have poured uh, some amount of time into this open problem of actually trying to prove something about this integrality gap. Um, and a couple of years ago, I decided that maybe the, the way to approach this problem was to think different. Um, it's an agenda I ended up calling looking under rocks. Uh, let's actually, rather than throwing more time at the subtour LP, maybe the right thing to do is to look at other types of LP, either LP or semi-definite programming relaxations, and see whether we couldn't possibly prove bounds on them instead. And with any luck, maybe we could get a better bound than the three halves bound that was given that we know about the subtour LP. So in particular, what I'm going to talk about today is trying semi-definite programming relaxations of the traveling salesman problem and trying to see whether we can prove something stronger about them than we can about the sub LP. So here's my outline for the rest of the talk. I've just finished my introduction telling you about the traveling salesman problem and about linear programming. Um, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to tell you a little bit about semi-definite programming in case you're not familiar with it, and then talk about semi-definite programming relaxations of the traveling salesman problem. Then I'm going to sort of to skip right to the punchline. What I'm going to show you is that the semi-definite programming relaxations that we've looked at all have, uh, in fact, don't have bounded integrality gaps, even for, met, even for fairly simple cost functions. Um, we're going to be able to show that this, these semi-definite programming relaxations have unbounded integrality gaps. So the, the hopes that we went into with, for this project were not realized, but at least we know what the truth is about these particular semi-definite programming relaxations. I'll end up with talking very briefly about one more semi-definite programming relaxation, and um, then I'll end up with some, some open questions. Um, again, any of you who have a question should feel free to unmute and try to, try to ask me questions. And maybe I should stop now and just make sure there aren't any questions about this first part of the talk. It'll give me a chance to sip some water, too. Okay, hearing nothing, I'm gonna move on. So uh, here's a brief introduction to semi-definite programs in case you're not familiar with them. So uh, a semi-definite program is very similar to a linear program, except what we're able to do is we're allowed to take a set, a matrix of variables and declare that it has to be positive semi-definite. And the way we're gonna notate that is we're gonna say that an n by n matrix is sort of curly greater than or equal to zero to denote that x has to be positive semi-definite. Now, if your linear algebra is a bit rusty, um, we say that an n by n matrix is positive semi-definite if and only if y transpose xy is greater than or equal to zero for all n vectors y. Um, another thing that we're going to be using quite frequently throughout this talk is that if we have a, a real symmetric matrix, that's positive semi-definite if and only if x has all non-negative eigenvalues. So uh, a, a semi-definite program looks something like this. Um, 
we're trying to minimize uh, an objective function that's linear in those matrix variables, so the variables x, i, j coming from an n by n matrix x, uh, subject to some, some linear constraints on the, the matrix variables, and then again subject to the fact that we want this matrix to be um, positive definite. And we'll always be working with matrices that are real and symmetric, so um, we have that. I'll list that as a condition here, but that's always going to be true. Um, the interesting fact about semi-definite programs is that we can solve them efficiently. There are polynomial time algorithms to actually go ahead and solve these semi-definite programs um, using some of the interior point methodology that was developed for uh, linear programs. So here's the first semi-definite programming relaxation of the traveling salesman problem that I'm aware of. Uh, it was introduced by these three authors. Um, unfortunately, I don't know how to pronounce their names and I'm not gonna try to uh, make a fool of myself by trying. Um, so it was introduced by these three authors in 1999. Uh, what's, what's the relaxation look like? Well, what they show is that this actually is a relaxation. You look at this and maybe it's not so obvious. And they say that if you set X, our, our matrix, to be the adjacency matrix of any Hamiltonian cycle, then it's a feasible solution to this. And it has the cost of the corresponding tour. Right, so that just means I, for every pair of adjacent vertices i and j in my tor, I set x i j to one, I set all the other entries equal to zero. That gives me the adjacency matrix. Um, because I repeat the entries x i j and x j i, I have to have this factor of a half out front to get the cost of the tour. Let's look at why this in fact gives, is a relaxation of the traveling salesman problem. So why is, why is any Hamiltonian cycle, or the adjacency matrix of any Hamiltonian cycle, a feasible solution to this this semi-definite program. Um, well, certainly if you have uh, an adjacency matrix of a Hamiltonian cycle, then its diagonal entries are all zero. All the entries lie between zero and one. That's a real and symmetric matrix. So all of those are, are fairly easy conditions to satisfy. Um, this first condition up here is actually, is exactly equivalent to the degree constraints that we had um, for the sub LP. They just say that if I look at uh, any particular vertex, and I sum all the, the variables incident on that vertex, that sum should be exactly equal to two. Um, the, so the real tricky constraint here um, is this constraint here, the one that's now in blue, that says two times the identity matrix minus our matrix X plus J, which is the all ones vector, all ones matrix, minus two minus two cosine of two pi over N times the identity matrix has to be a has to be a positive semi-definite matrix. Um, you can treat this as just being a mystery if you'd like, but if you know a little bit of spectral graph theory, I can walk you through why this is, uh, why this is a constraint. So all this is saying is that the weighted graph that corresponds to x, right, if you put the value xij as the weight of every edge ij, then that has to be at least as connected with respect to what's called the algebraic connectivity, uh, the second uh, eigenvalue of the Laplacian as a cycle. Um, so how do we get that? Well, this matrix here, 2i minus x, um, gives us the Laplacian matrix corresponding to that graph that's weighted uh, according to the entries of x. Um, this, end, this matrix j makes sure that we don't uh, think about the sort of trivial eigenvector for the, the Laplacian, which is, uh, has an eigenvalue of zero. So the all ones um, vector, uh, which we're denoted by E here, is, a, is an eigenvector for the Laplacian of eigenvalue zero. So this makes sure we don't deal with those. And this is just saying that I want to make sure that all the last term here is making sure that all the non-trivial eigenvectors of that Laplacian have eigenvalue at least two minus two cosine two, two pi over n, which is the smallest non-trivial eigenvalue of the cycle as well. Okay, so um, unfortunately, one of the things that was shown almost immediately after this relaxation was developed by Gomans and Brendel is that this STP is not very strong. Um, in particular, any solution that's feasible for the subtour LP is also feasible for this semi-definite program. So we don't get any better bound um, out of this STP relaxation than we were getting out of the subtour LP. In fact, uh, one of those things that's going to pop out of the results that I'm going to show you later on is that this semi-definite program, in fact, has an unbounded integrality gap. So with respect to cost functions that are metric and symmetric, it's not even as good as the, the sub zero LP. Okay, so the first SDP relaxation wasn't any good for us. What about the, what about others? 
Um, here's a, a second semi-definite programming relaxation that was introduced in 2008 by Etienne de Klerk, Dima Pesechnik, and Renata Sotira. Um, and they also showed two things. First of all, this is uh, a relaxation of the traveling salesman problem. And secondly, that in fact, it's incomparable with the sub LP. So they did some computational experiments with the semi-definite programs and showed that in some cases, this result, this SDP gave a better bound than the sub LP. And in some cases, sub LP gave better bounds. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but the first time I set my eyes on this relaxation, it's something quite astonishing or quite strange happened to me. Normally, when one looks at a relaxation of a problem that you're familiar with, it's easy to see that it is, in fact, a relaxation. But I claim, at least for me, that's not at all obvious that this is a relaxation of the traveling salesman problem. So one of the things I'd like to do for you over the next few minutes is convince you, at least at some level, that this is a relaxation of the, semi, uh, of the traveling salesman problem. So how are we going to do that? Well, let me... Actually, maybe I should talk about the, the format of this relaxation first. So this relaxation has a bunch, has k different n by n matrices, or has d different n by n matrices, where d is, is roughly n over 2, so the floor of n over 2. So I'm dealing with uh, n over 2 n by n matrices here, uh, x super k for each one, um, and then a bunch of constraints on those. So what are these supposed to represent? What, you know, if I wanted to show that any given tour was feasible, what should I set these matrices x sub k, x super k to be? So the idea is this. I should let x super i be the ith distance matrix of a cycle. And for simplicity, let's just deal with the cycle that goes from 1 to n. And for the ith matrix, I'm going to set the jkth entry equal to 1 if the two vertices j and k are distance exactly 1 apart in the cycle and 0 otherwise. So the, the first matrix, so x super 1, is just going to be the adjacency matrix of the cycle, right? If I have the cycle 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, then I'll put 1s in the 1, 2 entry, the 2, 3 entry, the 3, 4 entry, and so on. x super 2 um, is going to be the we'll have ones in the entries where all the vertices are exactly distance two apart. So I'll have an entry for one, three, I'll have an entry for two, four, I'll have an entry for three, five, and so on. And then the same thing for all the, the other matrices as well. So once you have that uh, desired solution in mind, then it becomes clear that they satisfy these constraints, right? That all those matrices will be greater than equal to zero, all of those matrices will be symmetric. And then for this second constraint in blue here, um, if you sum all those matrices together from 1 up to n over 2, then they should be equal to all the all 1s matrices minus 1, right? If I think about any entry j, k, um, it has to be exactly some distance apart, you know, distance i apart for some i, but not for any other. So that, that particular matrix will uh, entry will be contributed, will contribute 1 in the ith matrix and 0 in all the other ones. And so if I sum them together, I get the all 1s matrix and I get nothing on the diagonal, so we subtract off the identity. Furthermore, it then becomes easy to see that, okay, that, that uh, minimizing uh, half the sum of the costs of the first distance matrix, so the adjacency matrix of the cycle itself, is exactly what we want for the objective. So really, the only really tricky thing is this constraint here that says the identity plus the sum of cosines over these x super j matrices has to be uh, positive semi-definite. Now, the way that de Klerk et al. reasoned about why this was a symmetric, uh, why this was, uh, why any Hamiltonian cycle actually was feasible for this case was that they appealed to some notions coming out of association schemes. Um, and uh, th since, uh, I imagine since I'm talking to a combinatorics and optimization department that there are plenty of people there who understand association schemes, but as a computer scientist, it wasn't part of my background. Um, instead, the way, uh, Sam and I ended up thinking about it was that the distance matrices of the cycles are something called a circulant matrix. Um, and then what we're taking here are linear combinations of circulant matrices, and those also turn out to be circulant. And circulant matrices have well understood eigenvalues. So all we need to do is be able to prove that the eigenvalues of this linear combination of circulant matrices are, are actually all greater than or equal to zero and will be done. So what's a circulant matrix? Well, over on the left hand side of my slide here, I have um, a particular uh, example of a circulant matrix, right? We have a row of entries, M0, M1, M2, going up to Mn minus 1. 
to get the next row of the matrix, all we do is we slide things over by one and we take the last entry and we wrap it around to the front. Um, and then same thing for the next row and the next row and the next row. So everything is determined by exactly by this first row of the matrix. So what I want to do for you now is walk you through uh, very quickly a sketch of the proof that in fact um, any solution that comes out of those uh, distance matrices of cycles actually gives you a feasible solution um, to the semi-definite programming constraints. So here we again, again we have our circular matrix. There up at the top we have the constraint that we're trying to satisfy. Down at the bottom we have what we know about the eigenvalues of circular matrices. So I'm going to let little omega sub n be the nth root of unity. And it's known that to get the teeth eigenvalue of this circulant matrix M, all I have to do is sum up these entries in the following way. So the teeth eigenvalue, I sum from S equals zero to N minus one of entry MS of the first row times the nth root of unity taken to the S teeth power. And that gives me all of the entries from T from one up to N minus one. And the nth eigenvalue is just the sum of all the entries along the, the first row. So all I have to do for you is convince you that for the circulant matrix that corresponds to the, this linear combination of the X super J, um, that all of those eigenvalues in fact are greater than or equal to zero. Um, I'm gonna slide through this fairly quickly, but let me at least introduce you to, so here's the linear combination that we get um, if we think about these matrices X super J being the distance matrices of the cycle one through M. So we get to, if we sum up the identity matrix, we get ones down the diagonal. If we sum up these sums of cosines to all of them, we get uh, entries that look like this for the kth constraint. So now we just need to plug in that first row, come into our, uh, into our formulas for the eigenvalues and convince ourselves that all of those are, are gonna be greater than or equal to zero. So your formula ends up looking something like this. Um, and that looks fairly ugly, but luckily uh, Sam found for us a bunch of uh, identities, so Lagrange trigonometric identities that allowed us to sum these up fairly easily. You find that the eigenvalues are going to be either 2D, D, or 0. Remember that D is n over 2. Um, so this shows us that all the eigenvalues are in fact going to be greater than or equal to 0, and therefore um, our distance matrices coming out of the cycle satisfy all of these positive semi-definite constraints. Okay, so we've convinced ourselves that in fact, at some level anyway, that this in fact uh, is a relaxation of the traveling salesman problem. Um, what can we say about it? Well, the main theorem, as I've sort of already mentioned to you, is that we want to show that this uh, semi-definite program in fact has an unbounded integrality gap. So there exists no constant such that the ratio of the cost of an optimal tour to the cost of the semi-definite program is bounded above by that constant. And that's, uh, it can't, for, to do that, all we're gonna do is demonstrate one cost matrix or one set of cost matrices that are metric and are symmetric such that um, you can show for any constant that we're not gonna get this upper bound. So here's the particular set of cost matrices that we're gonna consider. In fact, they're fairly simple. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take two groups of, the, of N vertices. Let's assume that N's even. So I'll take n over two vertices and put them on one side, n over two vertices and put them on the other side. The cost for traveling within any one of those two groups I'm gonna set equal to zero and the cost for traveling between those two groups I'm gonna to set to be equal to one. So the cost matrix in general looks something like this, uh, a zero, uh, one, one, zero, Kronecker product with the all, ma all ones matrices of, uh, all one matrix of dimension n over two. And here we have a six node example down at the bottom. I claim it's pretty easy to see what the optimal tour should be in this case, right? If I start at the city one, I can visit two and three at a cost of zero. I incur a cost of one to go to this other group and visit cities uh, five, four, and six. And then at a cost of one, I go back again and visit city one again. So overall, the cost of the optimal solution for any instance of this form uh, is gonna be cost exactly equal to two visit all the cities in both groups at a cost of zero and then cost of two going back and forth between the two different groups. Um, this cost matrix corresponds to something that's called a cut semi-metric and it also is itself an instance of the Euclidean traveling salesman problem. If you think about embedding 
the vertices one through n minus two at zero on the real line and the other vertices at one on the real line, then the costs are just given by the Euclidean distance between the corresponding pairs of vertices. Okay, so what we're gonna end up showing is that for this particular set of cost matrices, the value of the semi-definite programming relaxation is gonna be bounded above by something like uh, pi squared over n. And since we know that the cost of the optimal tour is in fact is equal to two, the cost of this semi-definite programming relaxation is getting smaller and smaller as n increases, while the cost of the optimal tour stays the same, which then implies to us that there is gonna be no constant such that the, the integrality ratio uh, of that relaxation is gonna be bounded. Uh, from above. So how are we going to end up proving this? Um, well, we're going to do the following thing. The first thing is that we're going to guess uh, a particular highly symmetric set of solutions um, that correspond to the symmetries we get out of that cost function. Um, Having guessed a particular set of solutions, that's going to give us some constraints on the semi-definite programming relaxation itself will give us some set of constraints on what those solutions can look like. Um, once we work out what those constraints are, they turn out to all be linear inequalities. And so therefore we can, um, we end up reducing the feasible solutions of that form to the semi-definite program to a linear program. And then we find a feasible solution to that linear program and we show that in fact it achieves this desired cost, something that falls off uh, as the number of cities gets larger. So what are we gonna guess? Um, well, we're gonna guess something like this. Uh, it says that if I think about a given matrix X super J, um, I'm gonna guess that uh, I'm gonna say, let's take all the um, edges that have cost zero and let's guess that their value on those edges is a, aj. And let's take all those edges that have cost one and let's guess that their value is bj for some val particular values of aj and bj. We don't know what those are yet, but we're gonna use the structure of the semi-definite program to give us constraints on what those values could possibly be. Furthermore, we're gonna guess that the sum of all the edges incident on any given vertex um, should sum up to two. So for instance, in this case, that gives me something like uh, n over two minus one of the edges of cost aj plus n over two of the edges of cost bj, that sum should be exactly equal to two. And therefore that allows me to express bj in terms of the aj. I can use that relationship to express uh, a relationship between those two values. So really all I have to do is try and figure out what the aj are and that'll give me the value of the bj automatically. So how can I do this? Well, what we need to do now is we need to say, okay, let's plug these values into the semi-definite program and see what kinds of constraints we get on these values of the aj and the bj. Let's first think about the objective function, All right? So um, for the, the distance matrix x1, we get these values a1 and b1. We had a1 on all the things that have cost zero, so they drop out. I have, uh, a value of b1 on all the edges that have cost one. I have something like n over two squared such edges. Um, so the value of the semi-definite program is gonna be something like n squared over four times b1. So what I should be trying to do uh, as I solve for this is try to make b1 as small as possible, which is gonna be correspond to trying to make a1 as large as possible. So now let's try to find some structure on what these aj and bj values have to be. So there's the form of my solution. I wanna verify that it's a feasible solution to our semi-definite program. So in particular, I need for any distance matrix that those values are all greater than equal to zero. I need that they sum up to be equal to the all ones matrix minus the identity, and I need them to be symmetric. They are already symmetric, so I don't have to worry about that. The fact that the matrix has to be greater than or equal to zero implies that these values aj and bj have to be greater than or equal to zero. The fact that they, these matrices sum up to the all ones matrix minus the identity means that the sum of all the aj values themselves have to be equal to one. Okay, so that takes care of three of the four constraints and we're left with a difficult semi-definite constraint to say what, what does that have to say about our values of aj and bj? So if we plug in our distance matrices, we get that um, this matrix here uh, has to be positive semi-definite, where now I've introduced these A super K and B super K um, values that in fact are just linear combinations of these values that I introduced before, these AJs. 
And the particular linear combinations you have to take are expressed in this way. So a super k is equal to this particular sum of the ai, b super k is equal to this particular sum of the values of the bi. What we want to be able to say is that I know that the eigenvalues of these, this matrix on the left-hand side here, that these eigenvalues are all greater than or equal to zero. Um, and luckily, there's, some, there's enough structure here to come up with a fairly simple relationship to tell us what these eigenvalues have to be. We know that the, the relationships of a, of a matrix A chronic or B are just the products of all the corresponding eigenvalues coming out of the matrices A and B. Um, so we have these two matrices here. We have this two by two matrix and we have this matrix of all ones. We know that the all ones matrix of dimension D has one eigenvalue of, uh, of value D and all the other eigenvalues are zero. And a two by two matrix of this form, A, B, B, A, has eigenvalues that are A plus B and A minus B. So taking all these things together, we can tease out what these eigenvalues have to be if we want them to be greater than or equal to zero. So in particular, we know that when this matrix J sub D has an eigenvalue of zero, this first term in the sum has an eigenvalue of zero. We just want to make sure that the eigenvalues of one minus A super K times the identity is greater than or equal to zero, which will be true as long as one minus A super K is greater than or equal to zero. So the other case we have to worry about is when uh, this has an eigenvalue of D, in which case we know it's going to be D times uh, A super K plus B super K and D times A super K minus B super K plus this additional term of one minus AK. So taking those facts all together, we know that the eigenvalues of, of that matrix that we want to prove are greater than or equal to zero are going to be exact. We have to prove exactly that these three things um, will all have values that are greater than or equal to zero. Um, I told you that there was this linear relationship between, or there was this relationship between the, the little values AJ and BJ. And using those, uh, oops, we can uh, express a relationship between this A super K and B super K. So that in fact, the B super K is exactly equal to this expression in terms of A super K. If we plug this into the second type of eigenvalue, it turns out that that value turns to be zero. So the only thing we have to worry about is that one minus A super K is greater than or equal to zero. And this last expression, one minus A super K plus n over two, A super K minus B super K, that that is also greater than or equal to zero. Now, the thing that you should notice about this is that what we're trying to do is prove linear inequalities on these values uh, that we expressed in the first place, these A sub J. So in order to think about maximizing that value A1 to get the, an SCP value as small as possible, we end up with just a linear program. We're trying to maximize A1 subject to this, this constraint. The first constraint comes out of the fact that we want um, that last eigenvalue expression to be greater than or equal to zero. Um, this second constraint comes out of the fact that we wanted that one minus A super K to be uh, greater than or equal to zero. We needed that the sum of the A sub I should be equal to one. We needed that the A sub I should all be greater than or equal to zero. And this second to, the, uh, second to the last and third to the last constraints um, come out of the fact that we need that the bi's are going to be greater than or equal to zero. So now I have a linear program that's just written in terms of these n over two variables of the a sub i. I'm trying to maximize um, a sub one. And uh, all we need to do is solve it in the case for a general n. That turns out not to be so easy for general n, but it turns out that we can guess the solution, uh, which Sam did. Uh, he guessed that the following would be a solution for any possible value of n, and then all that matters is going ahead and showing that, in fact, it is a feasible solution to the problem. Okay, so once you have that, um, you can go back and ask yourself, okay, if that's, those are the values to the linear program, then a1 is equal to this value that's over on the right-hand side, and b1 is equal to this value that's over on the right-hand side, 1 minus cosine pi over d, where d is something like n over 2, um, all taken over n, and that's something like 1 over n cubed. Remember that we showed earlier that the ob objective function of the semi-definite program for this particular uh, set of costs was going to be something like n squared over 4 times b1. If b1 is something like 1 over n cubed, that gives us as the optimum value of the semi-definite program is something like 1 over n. Right, so once again, what we've established what we wanted to set out to prove, which is that the, the value of the semi-definite program is falling off like 1 over n as n grows larger, um, the value of the optimal tor is 2, 
uh, so that um, the integrality, there's, there's no uh, upper bound on the value of the integ uh, integrality ratio of the SVP. So again, what did we just do? We just showed that the SCP relaxation has an unbounded integrality gap. Um, to show that the solutions were bad, uh, we looked at this particular cost function. We said, okay, let's um, try to prove, let's look at uh, solutions to that SDP that have the same sorts of symmetries that the cost function does. Um, once you look at those cost functions, you look at what kind of constraints are imposed on it by the semi-definite program. That turns out to lead to this linear program. We guess the solution to a linear program, and we get something whose value uh, for the semi-definite program falls off like something one over n. Let me take a quick look at our time. Um, I was going to talk about uh, another SDP relaxation, um, but I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to. Um, we can show that first 1999. Uh, semi-definite program, uh, in fact, also has an unbounded integrality gap by using exactly the same uh, construction that we had here. But if we take our matrix X super one that came out of the semi-definite uh, programming relaxation that I just showed you, um, that's also feasible for that 1999 semi-definite program, has the same value and um, actually has the same algebraic connectivity as a cycle, which is kind of interesting. Um, there's some other problems that were considered by Etienne de Klerk and some other co-authors uh, that show that, uh, that they give a SDP relaxation for what they call the K-cycle cover problem, cover your graph by K different cycles. We can also show that that uh, relaxation using semi-definite programs also has an unbounded integrality gap. Um, here's the third SDP relaxation, which I think in the interest of time, I'm, I'm not going to cover for you. Um, there was yet another relaxation that was considered by Etienne de Klerk and Renata Sotirov, um, where they ended up showing that in computational experiments on small instances of the TSP, that it looked better than the subtour LP in many cases, so more than their previous SDP relaxation. But once again, we can show that um, this has an unbounded integrality gap. We need to generalize the class of examples that we looked at in order to prove that, but it's possible to sort of take some of the same techniques that we used for the SDP relaxation I just showed you and extend them to, for this newer SDP and show that it once again also has an unbounded integrality gap. So that brings me to the end of my time. Um, let me just pose to some open questions to end with. Uh, we can ask the question, how does this, how do either of these semi-definite programs perform on special cases of the traveling salesman problem? We've shown that the integrality is gap is unbounded for general costs and symmetric costs as well as Euclidean TSP. Um, there's a special case of in, that's been considered in the literature, including by Andra Shedu, who's on this call, um, of what's called a graphic TSP. You're given as input a graph, and your edge costs correspond to the shortest paths uh, in that graph. We can show that the integrality gap of the 2008 SDP is at most two. You could ask whether it's strictly better. Uh, we don't know the answer to that question. Another very natural question is, we know the subtour LP um, has an integrality gap of at most 3 over 2. We have this semi-definite program, which we know experimentally performs better than the subtour LP in some cases. One could think about combining the two things, right? Let's uh, add all the constraints, the cut constraints coming from the subtour LP to the semi-definite programming constraints. Could you prove something stronger uh, about the integrality gap of this combined um, relaxation? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Of course, there's this, still this big open question about trying to prove a big uh, tight bound on the integrality gap of the subtour LP overall. And there's still this agenda that I have of whether there exists some other TSP relaxation out there that has a provably tighter integrality gap than 3 over 2. That's still an open question. Finally, we know that this subtour LP is uh, extremely effective in practice. Um, and is there some way that we can understand that? I mean, this computer scientists have grappled with this question for decades now, right? We know that some algorithms work extremely well in practice, even if we don't necessarily know what their worst case is. The simplex method is another good example of such an algorithm. Um, can we somehow get beyond worst case analysis to talk about how, why things work well in some cases, even if they don't work well 
uh, for all possible instances of the problem. Uh, the two papers that I talked about today, the first one at length and the second one very briefly, were written with Sam. The first one appeared in the SIAM Journal on Optimization. The second one is scheduled to appear in Mathematics of Operations Research. So that brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions now if people have any. Well, thank you, David, for the nice talk. And uh, let's see if there's some question from the audience. Hi, this is Steve Avasis. Hi, Steve. Hi, good to good to see you remotely again, uh, David. Yeah, uh, good to see you too. So, uh, in your uh, in your uh, famous paper uh, about uh, Max Cot, uh, I mean, one of the results in the paper was that if you have an SDP solution, then you 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 provided a method to get a a, a candidate solution for the original problem with the the uh, you know the hyperplane uh, the random hyperplane. Uh, right, right, right. So. For the, this de Klerk uh, relaxation, is there any plausible strategy that you could think of that uh, would, would produce a, 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 a Hamiltonian cycle out of their STP solution? Um, well, that's a great question. Um, but I kind of gave up on the question once I realized that the gap was unbounded, right? So the, um, I, I had some ideas which involved sort of thinking about what would happen if you took the initial matrix X super one and projected it projected those vectors into a plane and then just sort of did a sweep around them and that would give you a cycle but but you know proving anything about such a method would be extremely hard I think and luckily for me as somebody who's interested in worst case analysis because I now know it wouldn't go anywhere I don't have to think about that part of it any harder thank you uh, yeah um, yes. Andras go ahead uh, uh, you mentioned the upper bound for the graph TSP, uh, the, the upper bound of two. Is there a lower bounds or do you have examples showing uh, how bad it can be? Fun? Yeah. Uh, I think the answer is no, although I'll, maybe I'll refer to Sam too. Sam, did we ever find lower bounds on how good it could be? We never proved lower bounds, but it looked like if you put a path, it probably got to two. Yeah. Fun? We couldn't prove anything, I think, is what Sam is answering. That we kind of suspected that maybe two was as good as it was going to get. But all of a sudden, dealing with, with these graphic TSPs, because the entries are all not, now not just zero or one, but all kinds of different values became much harder to think about. Okay, any other questions? Well, maybe I can end uh, this one. So, but my question sort of has been addressed in your open problems. So I was just wondering if there are known um, TSP, in uh, TSP instances where the SDP relaxation does work better than the um, subtour LP. Of course, yeah. in, uh, in, in practice, it, it seems that it works better in some instances. I wonder if there's something that's like, you can really prove, for instance, in certain instances, it is really, it is like even maybe the band is below both, um, four over three, that was the lower bound of the, of the um, LP one. Um, right. You know, something like that. Well, first of all, Etienne and his co-authors um, did do computational experiments for both those SDPs that they mentioned. Um, one of the things that I think is apparent to anybody who's dealt with practical SDP computation is those, um, those relaxations are really big, right? The, the, they have n over 2 n by n matrices with n over 2 SDP constraints. Um, so they were only solving them on really small instances, like 10 vertices, um, things like that. So even though the, the bounds were incomparable in those cases, it, it remains sort of an open question about what happens if you got the larger instances of the problem. It would be good to know that, you know, that as you point out, that the, the bounds were, it was still yielding in some cases better bounds than the sub LP once you got the, something that was more reasonably sized. But, but computing with those bounds is pretty hard. Um, 
Thank you. Um, other questions? Sort of re related to what Jane asked. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so you have uh, uh, you have looked at these SDPs from the literature and found negative evidence for several of them. Yeah. Uh, but uh, is there anything uh, either in the literature or that you conjectured that could possibly be uh, significantly better than uh, than the sub two LP? You mean semi definite programming relaxations, or just anything at all? Uh, SDP, SDP. I meant SDP. Uh, in particular, you know, uh, apply um, apply the Loa Scriver SDP tightening, for example. Um, I think we kind of killed them all, at least all the ones we know about. Um, the, um, I mean, this last SDP relaxation, which I didn't talk about in any, except very briefly. Uh, that was looking very stubborn for a while, like we weren't going to be able to say anything about it, but eventually we got there. Um, and I think that sort of resolved all the open SDP relaxations that I, I'm aware of in, in the literature. I mean, you, you pose an interesting question, right, which is let's just start with a, let's just start with a sub through LP and then think about doing SDP liftings of that. Um, and, and does that bias anything? Uh, no, 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 not quite. Uh, no, you don't want to do that. Okay. No, I, I, I don't mean uh, start with uh, Subtour. Uh, I think you, you had told me some years ago about uh, this uh, assignment-based uh, QP. And if you, uh, if you uh, do a lifting on that, uh, it, it really is plausible that the thing is uh, better, better than uh, Subtour LP. Um, yeah, that was sort of what I was going to, that's the part I skipped over, right? This starts out with a, with a relaxation of the quadratic assignment, formulating TSP as a quadratic assignment problem. Um, uh, then looking at a corresponding SDP relaxation. And then the quadratic assignment problem actually gives you some flexibility in terms of the ordering of the vertices. So the, the final SDP relaxation is to fix one particular uh, starting point of the tour. You'll say that you're going to start, your tour will start at vertex one. Um, and you look at just those, and that's the final SDP relaxation, and that also has an unbounded integrality. Um, okay, so I think if there is more question, maybe we can discuss a bit um, in the virtual grad house time. Um, so let's thank David for this uh, great talk. I have something. <laughs> Does it work? <laughs> okay, so, okay, so thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so so we are going moving to this uh, <clears throat> virtual grad house time, and uh, David, you are you are welcome to stay and uh, socialize with the people in, <clears throat> people in the department. Yeah, I'm happy to hang out for a little bit. Uh, probably about five o'clock, I'll take off and, and go home. So David Andras just asked me yesterday, is this new uh, Christophides better than Christophides bound? Yeah. Is that also for a deterministic algorithm? Is it a deterministic algorithm? No, I think it, no, well, can it, well it's randomized as stated. I guess the question is, can it be de-randomized? Yeah, so um, we, we uh, looked at it with Anke and also with Jens, but just by uh, text analyzing, and in the abstract, it claims to have beaten uh, Christophides, so giving, giving a better algorithm than Christophides, and doesn't mention any uh, randomized feature. But uh, then in the theorems inside, uh, it speaks about random algorithms. So, uh,